Welcome to joy. Hope you got to enjoy some of that sunshine and warm yesterday. Kind of took my voice away today, but but it was great to get out in the sunshine and get some work done out in the flower gardens and such, so praise the Lord for that. Well, we all know about the tongue. We have all gotten into trouble with our tongues, and we're back in the study of, the, of James, the epistle of James. We're in chapter number three today in that series that I've entitled Christian Conduct in a Depraved Culture. We live in a truly depraved culture, and all of us know how much trouble that our own tongues have caused us down through the years, how many times we said something we wished we hadn't, and Sometimes we say things that hurt, even those that we love, and we have a lot of, a lot of issues with the tongue. Now, the tongue today has become so weaponized, words have become weaponized, and it's probably always been that way, at least for a very long time. But, uh, you know, we've all seen and we've all experienced the horrible power of hate-filled words. Lies that pit one person against another, that, that want to raise one person above another, or, or help one by destroying someone else. We've seen those words, and we see them all over today. It's very hard to find truth in our current society. And um, words, though, are powerful, and sometimes we don't uh, we don't think about that. We think about it if, it's, if you're in some powerful position, but not just in everyday living. And yet words are so important. God has given us tongues so that we can commune with Him, so that we can praise His holy name, so that we can lift the brokenhearted, encourage the saint, and also so that we can share the way of hope with a world that is hopeless. And yet so many times we end up just being pawns of the devil, instruments of destruction, because we fail to use our tongues the way God has called us to, the way God has equipped us to. And we just fall prey to being like everybody else in the world. And whether you like it or not, this world is run by the Ways of the devil himself, that one who most hates God. It's important then that we understand these words, we take them to heart, and we allow ourselves to be changed so that we can be what God wants us to be. In verse 13 through 18, which Brother Stephen just read, it says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Wow, listen to that. Where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Father, as we come before you today, we pray that, Lord, our hearts and our ears would be attuned to you, to a word from heaven. Lord, to your word from the very scripture. May it burn in our hearts. and Lord, be etched forever in our hearts and our will. Lord, may we be transformed by you today. May man's words not get in the way. Lord, may your Holy Spirit move as only you can. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. We have a problem among us humans where 
we have knowledge sometimes without wisdom. Knowledge without wisdom. This passage of Scripture that we see as chapter number 3 in the book of James begins, my brethren. What does that mean? It means he is addressing you and I, Christian, not the world out there. Not the people that don't know Jesus. Not the people that are following false religions. Not the people that are uh, non-religious or anything else. We're talking about he is speaking specifically to you and I as believers. And he says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. What's he talking about here? You see, knowledge has the tendency to puff up human beings. In 1 Corinthians 8, it talks about knowledge puffeth up. It says, but charity edifieth. So if we get a hold of knowledge without wisdom especially, but we get knowledge, it kind of makes us have a big head. Hey, I know more than them. I want to do this. I want to do that. I'm better at this. And it tends to be destructive, not beneficial. But charity builds up other people. What is charity? Charity is active love. Love put to work. A little knowledge that we feel is important will often cause an arrogant spirit, a belief that we need to be in control or manipulate other people or we need to make sure everybody else fits into the box that we think they ought to fit into. And that's not right. First of all, none of us are infallible. That's only for God. But secondly, how are we going to fit people into a box that even if we have the Scripture understood on a particular area, how are we going to fit people that don't even know Christ who will not fit into that box? How are we going to try to force them into that box? The best that we do is make them conform to a set of rules and regulations But if they don't have Christ in their heart, they're still hell-bound. It does them no good to walk and talk like a Christian if they don't know Christ. We've made them, as the Scripture talks about with Judaism at one point, made them doubly the children of the devil. Because now they think they're children of God. And yet it won't work because they don't know Jesus. You know, we have, in in our society today especially, we cry out against those that offend us, but we think nobody should be offended by what we say. First of all, because we're right. Okay? And everybody believes that. (laughs) They're right. And they feel like they should be able to say anything they want, and you should just listen to it, bow down to it. And we Christians do the same thing. But it's okay if we get offended at what they say. Because, see, we're right and they're wrong. It doesn't work. That's not what this is about. He says, be not many masters. Don't think you know it all. And don't think you have a right to rule and reign over everybody because you know a little bit more about any subject, but especially even the Word of God, that you have the ability to rule and reign over them, make them fit into some little box. Now, this is not to say we don't teach truth. This is about how we teach truth, how we uh, confront sin, how we do a lot of those things. Because the truth is what sets people free. They need to hear the truth of Jesus Christ. They need to hear the truth that all sin leads to death. But we can say that in a way that will lift up Christ and lead them to Christ, or we can say that in a way that says, you're less than I am, I don't need you around me. And how are we going to fulfill the Great Commission if we're constantly driving everybody away? It won't work. In today's society, you can see the power of words. There have always been people with power. But today, people just repeat a word enough and then others 
get all riled up, up in arms. They're burning places. They're hurting people. They're trying to change all kinds of things just because somebody kept repeating a word, whatever that is, a belief. <clears throat> so we need, to, we need to understand that in this corrupt, depraved culture that is trying to push everything righteous, everything godly, everything about the hope of Jesus Christ away from everybody and trying to fill it up with anything else, it doesn't matter, that we have a responsibility to behave in a certain way, to speak in a certain way, so that people will be even willing to listen to what we have to say. You can have the greatest truth ever, but if people won't listen, it's not going to do them any good. Verse 2, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. It says here that we who are Christians and who like to get up on our high horse and say, this is right, that's wrong, you're all wet, you know, you need to change everything about who you are and what you believe. And we could even be right. But all we do is beat them down. All we do is drive them away. How are they going to find the hope of Jesus Christ? We offend people all the time and sometimes don't even know it. And he says, so when somebody says something that offends you, don't let it create a barrier. Listen to it. Maybe there's something good in it. Maybe not. Compare it to the Word of God, that's the way you'll know if it's truth or not. But you haven't severed a relationship because you got angry with what they had to say. You still have influence. You still have an opportunity to reach these people. It says, if you can control your tongue and never say the wrong thing, Always have the right attitude coming out of your mouth. Always be speaking the right words and building other people up. It says, you probably got your whole life perfect. Well, we know from experience there's only one guy that ever did that, right? That was Jesus. So every day, you and I are going to struggle with this. But just because it's normal to struggle with it doesn't mean it's okay for us to behave that way. Just because our culture is all about hatred, all about destruction, does not give us the right to behave the same way. A lot of times we say, hey, that's the way they treat me, that's the way I'm going to treat them. Jesus didn't do that. And we're here to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives examples on how powerful the tongue is. How powerful is the tongue? He says the tongue is this little member, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts us great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. First of all, he says, you know, people have some success and the tongue starts going off and saying, hey, look at me, I'm so wonderful, I've, I do everything right and I'm the best. He says, Tongue probably didn't have anything to do with that. I mean, one of, the, one of our teenagers uh, here, the Clay's granddaughter, I mean, she said she took first place in everything she ran in an attract me. That's great. Awesome. She didn't run with her tongue. Now, she didn't tell me that. I had to ask her, so she wasn't bragging about it. Okay, I don't, I don't want you to take that part. But, you know, we can have these great accomplishments, but as soon as we start bragging about it, you know, tongue didn't have anything to do with that. Right? He says, we control horses with a small bit. You can control a thousand pound, twelve hundred pound horse. This little piece of metal in its mouth. The way it works is it causes pain. And the horse is smart enough to say, it's painful if I don't do what they want me to do when, I, when they pull on this ring. 
Now, you and I have caused so much pain and have received so much pain because of wagging our tongue and doing the wrong things, saying the wrong things, and yet we're not smart enough to say, hey, stop doing that. We just have to suffer the pain all the time in our relationships and in our jobs and our schools and all of these things. I mean, the horse is smarter than we are, right? Just look at these great ships. They can be huge, and by comparison, their rudder is such a small thing, and yet it turns the entire ship. The words that come out of your mouth can have an impact far greater than you understand. When you're on the ship, you don't even see the rudder doing its thing. You just simply are turned. And when you're on the ship, if you don't have a point of reference, you don't even know if you're going around in circles or not a lot of times. Our tongue gets a little bit out of control. And we may have sidetracked our life in a way that we have yet to comprehend. Or worse yet, the life of someone else. It says, Behold, Great a matter, a little fire kindled. I've been reading about climate change lately and all the things involved with that. And, you know, one of the things that really struck me was there are so many fires now, forest fires, grass fires, all kinds of things. And one of the things that, that they found was that many, many, many of them are started by people. Not lightning, not something else. But all this destruction. And what can happen if somebody leaves a little fire going, walks away, doesn't think about it. Now thousands of acres burn, people's homes and everything that they have. People die in these fires all the time. Somebody flicks a cigarette out the window and there's some dry grass there, and the next thing you know, there's a big fire. They've driven on. They don't, they're not thinking about it. How many times in our lives have we said something, not thinking that it was hurtful, not thinking that it was destructive, and just went on with life, and little did we know, we started a forest fire in somebody's life back here. That's how powerful the tongue is. This is God's Word. So I take it for what it says, right? Sometimes you'll come in contact with somebody you spoke to years before, and it'll come up. You won't even remember having said something, but they have held an offense against you for years. All because we don't control this tongue. We're supposed to look and act like Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be creatures of benefit, not destruction. And yet, we go on with life as though it doesn't matter what I say. It's just a little thing. Who am I anyway? You know what? You're an influencer. You're affecting people's lives, whether you know it or not. As a matter of fact, in verse 6, he says, The tongue is a fire. A world of iniquity. Listen to those words. Iniquity is that like root of sin. That's where sin starts out. In that thought, in that action, in that heart that is not pure. And it says it's a, your tongue is a world of iniquity. Sometimes the things you say put into somebody else's ears and into their life become something more than they even were in your own mind and heart. How many times have you had that conversation where you're saying, that's not what I meant when I said this? So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. I mean, you can take any one of these verses and make a whole preaching series on it, but 
Today, I just want us to think about some of those words. We talked about a world of iniquity, but it says, it defileth the whole body. Now, when somebody truly offends you, says something offensive, cuts you down, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Now, the next time you see them, when they walk in the door, do you have to hear them speak for you to recognize that that's them, and now any part of them that you see wells up in you this whole, you know, uh, emotional and physical response. I mean, your heartbeat goes up, your blood pressure goes up, and you get ready to fight or run, whatever you are, okay? You don't have to hear them speak their tongue. They don't have to repeat it again. You already see their whole person in light of that one thing that they said. Now, believer, remember he said, brethren, believers, I'm speaking this to you. He says, now, your tongue defileth your whole body, not just your body, but you are part of joy. The things that you say reflect on all of us. When you're out there in the world and you're speaking to someone and you're speaking, speaking hateful things or destructive things and they know you're a Christian or you may have invited them to church or something else, they assume that all of us feel the exact same way as what you just spoke. You have defiled the entire name of joy and possibly the family of God, the whole church that is Christ's bride. So now, these people who are offended by you, Christian, don't want to go to church. They don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want anything to do with it because you couldn't control your tongue. Set on fire of hell. Wait a minute. I'm a child of God. I've got the Holy Spirit within me. I'm going to heaven. I'm one of the good guys. He says, but sometimes even your tongues do more to send people to hell than lead them to Christ. Shouldn't be. Because we don't think so dangerous, it's so destructive, a world of iniquity, of injustice, of immorality, of unrighteousness. It says that defileth, that is corrupting and bringing dishonor to the entire body. And he says, everything else in your life seems like it's tameable, but your tongue. And when people read that sometimes, they just take that as a license to say whatever they want. And that's not what it's saying. It's saying you need to put more effort into taming your tongue because it is so destructive. You and I have injured more lives with our tongue than we ever have with our hands. He says you need to pay attention to this because even your tongue, believer, the world of iniquity and set on fire of hell, You've got to be careful. See, <coughs> excuse me. I, I've used this example before, but my oldest son, quite a bit older than the, the next two, they'd be out playing in a backyard with a soccer ball or something, you know, and one of them would get, you know, hit in the face or something. And I would say, Stop that. And so I didn't mean to. Well, he probably didn't. But my answer was always, you know, he said, I didn't try to. I said, you should try not to. They're the little brothers. So when you're kicking the ball, you try not to hit them in the face. Not just, oh, they got in the way and got hit. You know, and, and we look at our kids and we say that, and, you know, sometimes that's small. But I think that's what the Lord is trying to tell us here. You know, your tongue is so powerful, more powerful than you even imagine. And you need to plan ahead. 
And make sure that when you interact with this person, when this situation comes up in life, when, when you're caught off guard by something, that you have a plan in place that says, I'm going to speak things that are encouraging, uplifting, beneficial. I'm not going to attack and tear down. And if you don't plan for it, if you don't teach yourself the way to respond, you're going to respond by default the way the devil in this world does. Destructive. The Lord Jesus Christ said, that's not who you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be me. Not, Not God, but an example. You know, he gave us our tongue. He's uh, to be a fountain of praise. To be a, you know, a, a giver of hope. He says, you're going to bless God one moment and curse the guy the next moment? Now what's he supposed to believe? What's she supposed to believe? You can't do that. You can't go up to a fountain and have you know, bitter water and sweet water coming out at the same time. So how are people to believe what's coming out of your mouth that it's beneficial now when all the rest of the time all they hear you do is spew destructive things? So you have to plan it out. You have to make sure you control your tongue. He says, Christian, it shouldn't be this way in your life. You know, it's so important. What's the difference maker? I mean, we, if we have the knowledge, if you're studying your Bible like you should, if you have in, you know, whatever knowledge in whatever field you're talking about, you know, that's all great, but knowing how to use it is something else. And that's the wisdom that he was sp- speaking of. The wisdom that is from above is so different than the wisdom of this world. That's what takes the knowledge that we have and turns it into something beneficial. Knowledge can be very destructive. It is in our minds. It is in our hearts sometimes. It is even in the world. People find out how to destroy something, so they destroy. They find a weakness. You hear that all the time. And how many times does your phone update and your computer update and all those things? Because people find a weakness, and what do they do? They exploit it to destroy, to steal, to do whatever. It's the way of the world. He says, okay, Christian, what are you doing? Put some protection, some limitations, some firewalls on your tongue. You get in tune with God. You get in touch with God and you work on it. Verse 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. You know, to have wisdom and knowledge is so different than just having knowledge and using it to beat people up and to manipulate people into your way of thinking. It says, you'll know the person that has wisdom by the way they behave, by the words that come out of their mouth, with meekness of wisdom, with humble discernment, with great insight, but without all the pretense, without all the judgment, without all of the arrogance. That's all he's saying. We're always supposed to speak truth. We're always supposed to be encouraging other people, but we have to do these things in love. To allow someone to think that their sin is fine with God, that's wrong. But to bash them over the head every day with it, is not going to help them find Jesus. If envying and strife, this is what he said, if envying and strife characterize your actions, if you, now we're not talking about talking about a situation. You know, I do marital count, premarital counseling and marital counseling and things like that quite a bit. And there's a lot that we need to understand and you have to be able to express what's wrong or you can't fix the problem. You don't know what it is. You know, but as soon as you turn that over to pointing fingers, now you're causing a problem, not fixing anything. 
And so what we're saying, how we're saying it, how we're approaching these things is so critical. He says, if envying and strife are your way of dealing with problems, this is who you are in the world around you, then that wisdom is at best earthly, most likely very selfish, and is mimicking the devil's tactics and the devil's agenda. And that's not my rendering, that's the scripture. This is God saying this. It is never justifiable in the believer's life to live that life of strife and chaos and and abuse and destruction. Because it always ends up in confusion and evil outcome. How is it that I can say that? Because God just said it. Okay? Okay? I used to say that to people all the time, especially when I was with the teens for years. It is never right to do wrong. But even doing the right thing, there's a right way to do the right thing. Okay? We need to understand that. And the world's ways don't lead you that way, especially in the culture we live in today. Just throw it all out there, attack everybody you can attack, and then just head for cover and just see who survives. That's not our job. It says, if all of this chaos, if all of this strife and all this envying that you have in your life, I've got to be recognized as the best of whatever, the one in control, says, you look like the devil. Now you're going to tell him God loves you? It's not going to work. Instead, he says, you know what heavenly wisdom looks like? First, it's pure. It is true, and it is honorable. You don't have to be ashamed of doing the right thing for the right reason. You know, a lot of people... Don't quite comprehend that, but I say it's like when you're at work and you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing and the boss walks up behind you. I may startle you that he's there or she's there, but but you're not ashamed because you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. But if you're doing the wrong thing, you're constantly looking over your shoulder, you're constantly (laughs) worried, and if the boss comes up, uh uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. You don't have to live that way. As a believer, you know the truth, now live it. Be pure, be true, be honorable. It says it's peaceable. That means it's more passive than aggressive. Now, we need to aggressively try to win the lost. But we don't do that by beating them up. We do that by leading them to Christ. You know, these actions that we have You know, God tells us that we need to reach the world for Him. That's our primary job while we're here, until we go to heaven, okay? But He tells us that we need to lift up the Lord and He'll draw them to Himself. We need to lead them to Christ. We're not out there to drive them, to beat them up, and to, you know, to corral them in until they have no choice but to go down that chute, you know, and get saved. It doesn't work that way. He says, lead them, and peaceable things work so much better. Gentle, moderate, patient in the way you deal with people. Easy to be entreated. You all know these people in your life. They're the people that can say something that you never really expected, but you just, you take it and you say, wow, that makes sense, and I I might be able to use that. And you're looking forward to... to, um, to taking it, uh, not only understanding it, but applying it in your lives. You know, they're very persuasive. Now, some people can be persuasive in a manipulative way, but that's not what this is about. This is about when someone's talking to you and the, the, their manner, the words they're using, their, their ability to, to explain things to you, 
just kind of set you at ease and let you step back and say, you know, I can get something good out of this. That's what easy to be entreated is. Full of mercy. An abundance of compassion and beneficial activities. That's what it's talking about. You know, we look at the world and we look at what they're involved in. We look at how many horrible things are going on. And we want to judge. We want to bring the hammer down. And we want to pray fire from heaven like the disciples said, you know. And Jesus said, no, 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 that's that's not the way we do it. Just have compassion. There's Jesus nailed to the cross, pouring out his lifeblood. He looks up to the Father and says, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. They don't get it. How can a lost and dying world that doesn't know Jesus Christ have any comprehension about how life is supposed to be and how God wants us to live and to be and to interact? without prejudice and without double standards, hypocrisy. It's got to be the same for everyone. And you have to be able to go through life and life's problems the same as they are, but instead of griping and complaining and blaming, you just stand up and you endure. You try to make things right, but you just keep on keeping on and you do it with a right heart and a right spirit with words that are beautiful and beneficial, not destructive and cutting. Because all those beneficial actions, all those peaceable things, they're for the purpose of bringing honoring, of honoring God and bringing peace. Now, not just peace between you and somebody else, but bringing into that person's life peace with God and the peace of God. If we could just in, you know, etch those words right in the forefront of our mind and see those and read them every time before we open our mouth, <laughs> how differently would we speak? How much more compassion and mercy and concern. Even if they're hateful to you, you know what's waiting them? An eternal torment in a fiery hell. Have some compassion and lift up the Lord before them and say, it doesn't matter. I've got Jesus and he's got As we speak the truth, it is so critical that we do it in love. You know, as we speak the truth, it's so critical that we do it in a way that will be received. That it's not hypocritical, that we're not this way with one person and this way with another. I mean, there are differences in people, but I mean, we're not hateful to one person and loving to another. We're not willing to help one person and and want to see the destruction of another. If people can see that in our lives with consistency, and they hear the words that come out of our mouth as being praising to God and glorifying God and caring about people around them, when they're going through a struggle in life and you're lifting up Christ and you're saying, let me show you the answer, they're going to be much more likely to listen and to be benefited by your testimony. It is very, very important that we get this. The troublesome tongue, oh, you can't count, like me, how many times we have said something that we just instantly regretted, or how many relationships we have damaged or destroyed because we got our feelings hurt and said something terrible. Okay, okay that's a loss. How many of those people maybe will never see heaven because they won't listen to anybody that will show them the way to Jesus? 
You have no idea how many lives have been affected by the words that have come out of your mouth down through the years. And you can't change a single one of them. But from this moment forward, we can stop and we can say, Lord, help me get control here in my mouth. Let me say things that matter. Let me be a benefit. Let me have compassion on all those around me as I speak. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, you can't get that power or wisdom from Him. You need Him first. If you're here without Jesus Christ, you need to know Him as personal Savior. You'll be on your way to heaven. Now, you're still going to have the same struggle with the tongue as the rest of us have, okay? <laughs> but at least now there's hope. Because that's the most important thing. Do you know Jesus? Heavenly Father, as we come before you at this time, we pray, Lord.